A long predicted cabinet reshuffle is underway this lunchtime. Who's in and who's out? Downing Street says the Prime Minister wants a strong and united team to focus on levelling up the whole country and building back from the pandemic. We'll be live at Westminster with all the details as they come in. The other main story is this lunchtime. Government scientific advisers warn there could be a surge in the number of people needing hospital treatment in England for COVID-19. Ministers say they are working to avoid that. We don't want to get to a position ever again where there's unsustainable pressure on the NHS so it's not able to, to see people in the, in, in the usual way when it needs to particularly emergency patients. A record jump in inflation to 3.2 per cent, the highest level in almost a decade as the price of food and transportation increase. Facebook is accused of keeping secret internal research which shows that using Instagram can damage the mental health of teenage girls. And to boldly go, four amateur astronauts make history as the first all-civilian crew to blast off into space. And coming up on the BBC News Channel, Manchester City begin their Champions League campaign tonight. Will missing out in last season's final serve as motivation? Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the BBC News at One. The Prime Minister is reshuffling his cabinet this afternoon. Downing Street says he wants a strong and united team to level up the whole country and to build back after the pandemic. Well, there has been speculation about whether there could be changes at the top of government, with questions in particular about the futures of the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, and the Education Secretary, Gavin Williamson. Let's go straight to our Chief Political Correspondent, Adam Fleming, who joins me now from Westminster. And uh, Adam, this is a reshuffle that's long been talked about and predicted. Afternoon, Ben. That is very true. It's been a subject of speculation in Westminster for weeks, either journalists and MPs just gossiping about what's going to happen or the government using it as a little tool to maintain discipline around the cabinet table as big decisions are being made. The reshuffle is now on. We've got confirmation from the government. It will happen today and tomorrow. Uh, different ranks of the cabinet and, and the lower orders happening on different days. We also suspect that if it follows the pattern of previous reshuffles, the firings will be done out of the public eye in the Prime Minister's office in the Palace of Westminster. So we will not see tearful former ministers walking out of their meeting with the Prime Minister. What we probably will see from this afternoon, though, is joyful new ministers or newly appointed ministers going into Downing Street to take over their new portfolios. You hinted at some of the speculation that, that there's been around the personalities. Dominic Raab, the Foreign Secretary, who came in for quite a lot of criticism for the government's handling of the, the evacuation from Afghanistan and not seeing the fall of the Afghan government coming. Then you talked about Priti Patel, the Home Secretary. She was accused and sort of found guilty of bullying her staff a couple of years ago. And she's been criticised for not gripping the situation with those migrant boats coming across the English Channel from France. Gavin Williamson, the Education Secretary, there seems to be negative headlines about him every week, every day, every hour. He is hotly tipped to be demoted from the Education Department. And there are just so many rumours around Michael Gove, who, if you look on social media, might be running every single department by the end of this week. And if you're watching all of this and thinking, why does it matter? Somebody I've not really heard or cared about being replaced by somebody else I might not have heard about or really care about. This does really matter. New people bring new ideas to old departments. And also new people also bring potential new conflicts with the Prime Minister over the next few years. Uh, Adam, thank you very much indeed. Adam Fleming will be back with you if we get any more details uh, during the programme. Now, government scientific advisers are warning there could be a big wave of hospital admissions for COVID-19 next month in England. But they say that surge could be avoided with some light-touch restrictions. Modelling from the government's SAGE Advisory Committee suggests that hospitalisations could increase from about 700 a day in England to as many as 7,000. There are fears the virus will spread more rapidly with children going back to school and staff returning to the workplace. Anna Collinson reports. 
all different sizes. From offering a vaccine to 12 to 15 year olds in school, to providing a booster jab to millions who may be more vulnerable to COVID. It's hoped vaccines will do the heavy lifting this winter, but will the government's plan A be enough to protect the NHS? As people return to the classroom and the office, government advisers say infection rates could rise. Modelling suggests this may lead to between two and 7,000 daily hospitalisations in England next month. The current average is around 750. The potential for the, the virus to cause um, huge numbers of deaths is, is greatly diminished. So that does, that does allow a bit more flexibility. Uh, um, but, but it does still remain the case that, that acting earlier will be more effective. SAGE members suggest introducing light touch measures like encouraging working from home, requiring all contacts of cases to isolate and clear messaging. The government's plan B includes some of these suggestions like mandatory face masks, but say this will only be triggered if the NHS is under unsustainable pressure. I don't think we're going to have to have another uh, lockdown. I think, uh, as I said, the, the vaccines are working and other measures. Uh, but I think it would be irresponsible for any health minister actually in, in, in the world to, to say that, we're, that this or that is 100% ruled out. As this graph shows, the number of people being admitted to hospital with the coronavirus in the UK is higher compared to 2020, though antibody levels are also higher thanks to the vaccine and natural infection. Even so, the exhausted health service is trying to juggle day-to-day -day care, reduce record waiting lists and prepare for other respiratory viruses. There's a finite number of staff and beds, so the more COVID patients, the less attention can be given to others. It's not just patients with COVID. We're busy with lots of other patients and emergency departments and acute um, units are really struggling. So our concern is if there is another increase in the number of COVID patients coming in that we really will not be able to do the things that we hope, which is keep normal care going and obviously do some of the catch up of the backlog. Nine months since the vaccine rollout started and there are still five million people who are yet to take up the offer. Emily was initially against it until she contracted COVID and became so ill she had to be placed in an induced coma in intensive care. Now in a community hospital, her road to recovery will be long. My lungs aren't going to be right. Um, I've had another lung infection from it. My one lung isn't taken in the air properly. So it's all the after effects. I've got a high heart rate. Even when I was on a ventilator, my heart stopped twice. So vaccinate, just have it done. Those working on the front line say winter has already arrived for the NHS. While it's hoped the vaccine will help, more disruptive measures and even possible lockdowns can't be ruled out. Anna Collinson, BBC News. Let's get an assessment of all of this from our health editor, Hugh Pym. So a warning then from government scientific advisers of a possible big surge in hospitalisations. How seriously should we take that warning, Hugh? Well, Ben, there's a huge amount of uncertainty around this. Uh, of course, the modellers back in July predicted quite a big surge in infections in August and a big increase in hospital numbers because society had opened up as a result of the ending of restrictions. And it didn't happen in that way. What they're saying now, in effect, is what they thought would happen in August may now happen in October. It's been pushed back a bit. And what will trigger it, possibly, they say, is not only the return of uh, school pupils, but also university students and a lot more people going back into workplaces on public transport, going back into towns and cities. But even then, they say there's a lot of uncertainty. The current rate of hospital admissions daily in England is around about 750. They're saying if there are some light touch restrictions, in other words, Boris Johnson's Plan B announced yesterday, where you encourage people actually to work from home and to wear masks uh, more extensively, then you could maybe keep it at about that level. But if you don't have anything like that, they argue, and the numbers going in and out of uh, towns and cities is quite high, you could get up to 2,000 hospital admissions a day and the virus spreads. 7,000 is the absolute maximum outlying position, which is based on a number of different assumptions. So there's no guarantee that any of these scenarios will actually develop, but it's an indication of how seriously officials see this winter. 
as we heard there from Anna's piece, on top of all the NHS pressures which are already building at the moment in hospitals up and down the country. Hugh, thank you very much indeed. Hugh Pym, our health editor. There's been a big jump in prices. UK inflation hit 3.2% last month. That's up from 2% in July. It's the largest increase in the rate of inflation since the Consumer Price Index was introduced almost a quarter of a century ago. Transport, food, eating out and recreation all pushed up the cost of living. And our economics correspondent Andy Verity has been taking a look through the figures. Andy. That's right, Ben. And part of the reason for the jump in inflation was the fact that you're comparing what was the case in August with prices in August the previous year. Now, in August 2020, the global economy was reopening, but there were still a lot of factors keeping prices down. There was still less activity than before the pandemic. You had the VAT cut for hospitality. That kept prices down, eat out to help out. But it's not just those comparisons with last year. It's also the fact that this year we've got a big and quick reopening of the global economy. And that's causing problems with supplying customers with what they want. You've got issues like a lack of fruit pickers, a lack of lorry drivers to deliver it. That's causing shortages, which threaten to push up prices further. A pallet of cooking oil at a record price, just one of the many basic supplies that have shot up as the global economies reopened post-pandemic, triggering the quickest price inflation for nine years. Food wholesalers like this one in Uxbridge that supplies upmarket hotels and restaurants are working as hard as they can but still can't meet demand. The current uh, priority issue for us is, is shortages. Um, every, every delivery that comes into our warehouse is affected in some way. It's either late, uh, doesn't turn up, or when it does turn up it's, it's short and that, that's due to the chronic shortage of lorry drivers. Everything this firm sells is packaged in cardboard, where it says prices are up by 40%, or plastic, where prices have jumped by 70%. With much higher shipping and fuel costs, they're expecting all firms like theirs to have to raise prices next year, if they haven't done already. With shortages of goods and lorry drivers and sky-high shipping costs, wholesalers like this are at full stretch just trying to get the goods in the back door to meet demand from their existing customers. They're turning new customers away. So far, they've been able to protect their customers from higher prices, but in the coming months, they're going to be forced to raise them. At restaurants like this independent pub near Windsor, prices were higher compared to August 2020 when the government's Eat Out to Help Out scheme allowed them to offer half-price meals from Monday to Wednesday. But it's also found that to offer the good service it wants to, it's having to pay higher wages. If we're going to start paying our staff as professionals and treating them like professionals, then they need to have a decent living wage, um, which is what we as a business have started to do. Um, and of course that is going to have a knock-on effect on how profitable our business is. And whereas we're happy to you know, take a, a slice of the pie, um, you know, our slice and give it away and share it with our staff. At some point, you know, some of that pie is going to have to come from the customer as well. Overall, consumer prices were up by 3.2%. Stripping out the effect of eat out to help out, it was 2.8%. The biggest single factor was petrol, with unleaded up 21.5 pence over the year to £1.35 a litre. Like the Bank of England, the Office for National Statistics says it believes the jump in the rate of inflation is temporary, as suppliers struggle to keep up with the reopening global economy. But if companies keep having to pay bigger pay rises to get the staff they need, that view may have to be revised. Andy Verity, our economics correspondent. A debate will take place in Parliament later on whether to keep the £20 a week increase to universal credit. It was brought in to support people through the pandemic, but it's due to be scrapped at the start of October. And the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, raised the issue at today's Prime Minister's Questions. Mr Speaker, how many extra hours a week would a single parent working full-time on the minimum wage have to work to get back the £20 a week the Prime Minister plans to take away from them in his universal credit cuts. Yeah. Of course what they want to do is to continue to, to take money in taxation and put it uh, into benefits. We don't think that's the right way, Mr Speaker. We want to encourage high wages and high skills, Mr Speaker. Well, let's uh, get more on this with our political correspondent, Ione Wells, who's at Westminster this afternoon. Ione, there's been quite a lot of opposition to scrapping this uplift. 
That's right. I mean, as we heard there, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, has accused the Prime Minister of clobbering workers by scrapping this uplift to universal credit, saying that somebody working full-time on minimum wage would need to work an extra nine hours a week to make up that £20. Now, the uplift was introduced at the start of the pandemic. It's due to be scrapped on the 6th of October, and that's attracted criticism both from the opposition and from charities, but also from a number of senior Conservative MPs too. The former Work and Pension Secretary, Stephen Crabb, uh, told me that he was part of that team in 2015 that took the decision to freeze in-work benefits when the Conservative message at the time was that the main route out of poverty should be work, not benefits. Interestingly, he told me uh, that uh, as a result, uh, wages didn't go up in the way that they planned and levels of poverty increased. And he fears that the government is about to make the same mistake again by cutting this uplift. Now, the government argue that this uplift was always meant to be a temporary thing throughout the pandemic. And the Prime Minister today reiterated uh, his view that he'd rather see people's wages rise through work and more skills. But his own Conservative critics argue that that £20 uplift would never have been made in the first place uh, unless there was a recognition that the original levels of universal credit weren't enough to help people when hardship hits. Ione, thank you very much. Shamima Begum, who left her home to join the so-called Islamic State group when she was 15 years of age, has again apologised for her connection to the terror group and repeated her request to be allowed to return to the UK. Begum remains in a Syrian refugee camp two years after the Health Secretary Sajid Javid rejoked, revoked her British citizenship when he was head of the Home Office. She's been speaking to the BBC's Josh Baker. Do you regret joining ISIS? Of course. I will regret it for the rest of my life. Whether you can see it on my face or not, it, it kills me inside. I lose sleep over it. And, and why is it you regret joining ISIS? Because ISIS ruined people's lives. ISIS ruined my life, my family's life, you know, and I will have to live with that. I mean, when you think back to being part of a group that did commit genocide, that did murder, that did carry out attacks around the world, how does that feel? It's, it makes me sick to my stomach, really. It makes me, it makes me hate myself. Shamima Begum. Well, our Home Affairs correspondent Daniel Sanford's here. Um, Daniel, several t interviews that she's given, media appearances, what do you think she's trying to achieve? You know, it's amazing transformation, isn't it, from the woman in the black uh, veil who emerged from uh, ISIS territory as uh, Islamic State group collapsed um, and gave those interviews, one of them essentially justifying the Manchester bombing because of the children that had died in IS territory to this woman with her hair uncovered, with sunglasses on her head. Um, in February, the Supreme Court said that she did not have the right to come back to Britain to fight to get her British citizenship back, that she would have to do that uh, from outside the country. And I think this is part of her battle to change how the British people think about her as part of that legal battle, to go back to concentrating on how she'd been groomed and tricked into going to the Islamic State, which was how many people perceived it at the time uh, when she went, um, and to try and uh, get some kind of sympathy uh, from the British people and, and also within the courts to try and get this idea that she was a vulnerable person who went uh, to, to travel to to the Islamic State and rather being the person who, uh, as Sir Sajid Javid put it when uh, he took away her citizenship, was a threat to British national security. Daniel, thank you very much. Daniel Sanford. Uh, the time is 18 minutes past one. Our top story this lunchtime. A long-predicted cabinet reshuffle is underway this afternoon. Downing Street says the Prime Minister wants a strong and united team as the country recovers from the pandemic. And coming up, the impact of stopping prison visits for children whose mothers are in jail. Coming up on the BBC News Channel, Europe's Ryder Cup captain, Pordrick Harrington, names Henrik Stenson as his fifth vice captain ahead of the tournament, which gets underway at Whistling Straits next Friday. Relatives of the four men who died in a mining disaster in the Swansea Valley 10 years ago are pressing for a full inquest into their deaths. No one has been held responsible for the Glacian Colliery disaster and the two surviving miners say they feel the tragedy and subsequent investigation have been swept under the carpet. Our correspondent, Wira Davis, reports. 
Ten years ago, there were just a handful of underground mines left in Wales. Small and privately owned, working conditions were often tough, cramped and dangerous. One such colliery was the Glacian Drift Mine in the Swansea Valley. On the 15th of September 2011, the unthinkable happened. A deliberate explosion intended to ultimately expand the mine instead sent a torrent of water down narrow shafts where seven men were working. Jake Wyatt was one of them. We heard the blast, obviously. Then, within seconds in, you could hear, well, they describe it as a jet engine and you can't, you, you can't describe it as anything else. Jake, boy. Hey, Jimmy, keep buddy? Son. Going, right? Reunited for the first time in several years, Jake and fellow survivor Nigel Evans recall those terrifying events for the first time. Well, that's when the water didn't then. It pushed me up against the wall. It was gasping for breath. My body was screaming. I said, they are dead, don't they? I said, they're not coming from there. Another man, mine manager Malcolm Firefield, also escaped. But despite the efforts of rescue teams working around the clock, to pump water out of the flooded mine, there was no hope for the other four men trapped underground. Charles Breslin, David Powell, Philip Hill and Gary Jenkins all died in the worst Welsh mining disaster for more than 40 years. The mine manager and its owners were later found not guilty on manslaughter charges after a trial that survivors and their families felt never explored the full facts of what happened. These marks demarcate a safe distance. Uh, Lee Reynolds, a former seven, surveyor for the Glacier uh, Mine, gave evidence at the trial. He raised concerns about alleged illegal mining at Glacier when it was under different ownership 10 years prior to the 2011 accident. They were making it extremely hard for me to be able to accurately survey the mine. There are safety concerns because the plan is, is, is inaccurate and there are so many recorded accidents where people have been hurt by inaccurate plans. As it stands now, nobody's been blamed, they? No, no one's had to blame at all. Somebody must take responsibility for four bodies, four men, four lives, isn't it, you know? Bricked up and abandoned just weeks after the tragedy, the Glacier Mine is out of sight, but not out of mind. A decade on, the survivors and the families of those who died are still looking for answers. Wirra Davis, BBC News in the Swansea Valley. And trapped underground, the Glacian mine disaster is on BBC One Wales tonight at 8pm and you can also find it on the BBC iPlayer. Four men have been arrested in the Londonderry area by police investigating the death of the journalist Lyra McKeep. The 29-year-old was shot while observing rioting in Derry's Craigan Estate in April of 2019. Our Ireland correspondent uh, Emma Vardy has got the latest for us. Emma. Men were arrested early this morning under the Terrorism Act. They were brought here to Musgrave Police Station in Belfast. Three of the men are aged between 19 and 21. Another man is aged 33. And this really is the most significant development in the case for some time. Police said this morning that the arrests were the result of detailed investigations over the past two years. Now, of course, Lyra McKee's death had a huge impact here in Northern Ireland back in 2019. She had been stood next to police with a crowd of people watching as rioting broke out in Derry's Cragen estate when a gunman from the new IRA fired towards the crowd and she was tragically killed. Now, at the time, both the British and Irish prime ministers attended her funeral here in Belfast. As well as being a journalist, she was always uh, also a very passionate gay rights advocate who believed in very much in a better future for Northern Ireland. Now, previously, one man has already been charged uh, with murder and possession of a firearm, but police have always believed that a number of senior figures in the new IRA were responsible for the events that night. Their investigation's always been continuing in the background, and these new arrests are the result of that. Emma, thank you very much. Emma Vardy, our Ireland correspondent. Most women in British prisons are mothers and through the pandemic, many of their children were stopped from visiting them. The Prison Reform Trust says this has had a significant impact on the children of imprisoned mothers, damaging their mental health and causing anxiety and nightmares. Karen Morrison reports. I had nightmares. I just wished I could see mummy. I didn't know if I'd ever see mum again. I miss my mum so much. It was so upsetting not being able to hug her. 
just some of the testimonies of children who couldn't see their mothers in prison during the pandemic. When the nation went into lockdown, so did prisons, and all visits were stopped, even for mothers and children. Tawana was sent to prison after drugs and a firearm were found in her house. She completed her four years in prison during the pandemic and is now home with her three young daughters. I think it did a lot of damage, actually. I mean, it did because, I mean, I'll, to have your mum, it's meant to be having your world and to have that taken away at such a young age. What was your biggest fear when you were in prison? My main biggest fear was um, my children stop loving me or they'll forget about me. To know that my mistakes put me in that position, which I totally, you know, I have a lot of regrets for, my choices, my bad decisions, and to know that that was going to affect your children that you were supposed to put first, you know, it is heartbreaking. We've had reports of those children uh, bedwetting, intense nightmares, and totally bewildered because they can't recognise their mothers when they see them on video calls. Um, really concerned about what this impact on the emotional well-being of children will really do to them in the long term. It wasn't just younger children who felt the pain of separation. When Vicky was convicted for tax fraud, her daughter was 16. Vicky was moved between three different prisons during the pandemic. Everyone felt it, everyone felt the frustration. they just being in, on, on the wing or in the house where I was was just, the atmosphere just changed completely, it just went, Everyone turned in on each other because you've got nothing, everyone, you've, everyone's feeling frustration. It's just, it was a horrible place to be in. All prisons have now resumed social visits and the testing of visitors is being rolled out to allow physical contact. But campaigners and their families are calling on the government now to keep visits with children and their parents in prison, even if other restrictions have to be tightened. The Ministry of Justice says the decision to stop visits was not taken lightly and we know the difficult impact this has had on parents in prisons, particularly mothers. But there is no question these measures helped save lives. Women's prisons were prioritised for the rollout of video calling and inmates were given extra phone credit to help communication with loved ones, especially children. A mum's job never ends. You can make mistakes, but you can pick it back up and make it even better. So I think that's where me and my children stand now. Karen Morrison, BBC News. Facebook has been accused of keeping secret internal research on Instagram, which shows it makes body image issues worse for teenage girls and can affect their mental health. And let's get the latest on that from our technology correspondent, Rory Kathleen Jones, who joins me now. Rory, how embarrassing is this for Facebook? Well, Ben, this was an investigation by the Wall Street Journal, which found that Facebook had conducted a whole series of studies over three years into the impact of Instagram with some quite worrying findings that were never uh, made public. Uh, amongst them, teens blame Instagram for increases in the rate of anxiety and depression. Uh, that, that's an internal presentation. We make body image issues worse for one in three teenage, teen girls, uh, another presentation. And uh, here's a, a worrying uh, statistic. Among teens who reported suicidal thoughts, 13% of British users and 6% of American users uh, trace the desire to kill themselves uh, to Instagram. So very worrying findings. Uh, already a reaction from one uh, senior British uh, MP, uh, Damon Collins, former Culture Select Committee chairman, said uh, time and again Facebook had been shown to be putting profit before preventing harm. Uh, Instagram came out with a blog last night defending itself saying the paper had only emphasised the negative aspects of the research. The research had also found that there were positive uh, aspects to, to using uh, Instagram. Uh, but the, the whole point of the research, it said, was to help deal with these issues, to help improve the service uh, and lessen the harm, uh, any harm caused to users. Rory, thank you. Rory Kathleen Jones. Now, it is uh, one small step for billionaires, but could it be a giant leap for space tourism? The first ever civilian manned spaceflight is due to take off from Florida after midnight with a four-person amateur crew led and funded by entrepreneur Jared Isaacman. It follows a summer space race between some of the richest men in the world, including Sir Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos. Jonathan Amos has this report. There are four people who want to make a difference on Earth and off it. Jared Isaacman, Haley Arsenault, Siam Proctor and Chris Sembrowski, the Inspiration4 crew. They're all amateur astronauts. 
Six months ago, they were pursuing everyday careers. Today, they're the subject of a Netflix documentary series and are preparing to climb aboard a SpaceX capsule to rocket into the sky. It's been made possible by Jared Isaacman, a wealthy businessman with a passion for planes and some big dreams. I've been going to the, to the space station for some time and there's just unbelievable science and research and great contributions that are coming out of there. But if we're going to you know, go to the moon again and we're going to go to Mars and beyond, then we've got to get a little outside of our comfort zone and take that you know, next step in that direction. Mr Isaacman purchased the spaceflight but then gifted the three adjacent seats to people with an inspirational story to tell. That's exemplified by 29-year-old Haley Arsenault. She overcame bone cancer as a child and as an adult has gone back to work for the hospital that cured her. I remember getting off the phone and my hands were shaking. It was just so exhilarating. Um, this is definitely not something I ever imagined would happen, um, but I think that's what it makes it so fun for me. And lift off. In the 60 years since the first human went into space, fewer than 600 people have ventured above 50 miles in altitude, and most of those have been military trained personnel. The Inspiration Four believe they're breaking new ground. They don't have what was famously called the right stuff, and if they can go to orbit, they say anyone can. Jonathan Amos. BBC News. All right, time for a look at the latest weather forecast. Here's Helen Willits. Hi, Ben. The atmosphere closer to Earth here. This was Cambridge yesterday where we had almost a month's worth of rain. It was pretty wet, wasn't it, across many eastern parts of England. Very different outlook at the moment. This was Cambridge sure, a, a couple of hours ago. As you can see, plenty of sunshine around and we'll see plenty more warm sunshine, dry weather over the coming few days. Although at this time of year, there'll be some fog and that'll be reluctant to clear, lingering through the rush hour. And it's not all plain sailing. We do have this weather front across Scotland and Northern Ireland. This was yesterday rain that's moving away into Scandinavia. This is the satellite picture so you can see that with that weather front in the west there's a lot of cloud for Western Scotland and for Northern Ireland but for the vast majority plenty of sunshine it's dry as well just a little bit more clouds still mulling around in central and eastern England closer to that area of low pressure from yesterday but it's still warm we've still got bright or sunny spells just a few showers on this weather front so it's even here it's not raining for all but it's a little cooler for most it's another warm day where you had the sunshine yesterday and it's warmer where we had the rain certainly so compared with yesterday the evening and overnight will bring this weather front eastwards and you can see it intensifies those showers particularly for the northern half of Scotland before it clears elsewhere we'll have more clear spells actually so a little bit more mist and patchy dense fog by morning and temperatures just a degree or so lower we're starting to lose some of that humidity but you can see already a curl of cloud coming into the west through tomorrow morning so although for many it's a decent day we'll have that fog through the rush out could be quite dense so do watch out for that this time of year it does catch people out because it's lasting for a little while longer but later on we've got some patchy rain coming towards northern ireland western scotland brisk a brisk breeze picking up here but for most of us warm again 17 to 20 two degrees Celsius because of the ridge of high pressure, which we think will hang on in eastern areas on Friday. But here comes the next Atlantic low, which is really giving us a headache as we get towards the weekend. For Friday, it looks as if it will be a slow moving affair across Northern Ireland, Western Scotland, Wales and Western England. So these areas likely to get the rain. It could be quite heavy, as you see, with a quite a brisk southerly wind. But further east, because it's a southerly wind and it's drier with some sunshine, It'll be another warm and bright day, as we've talked about, with some spells of sunshine around. But the weekend, that area of low pressure stagnates, or that weather front develops an area of low pressure and stagnates. We think across southern and western areas more than anywhere else, but clearly with weather fronts and low pressure close by, we can't promise all a dry weekend. If you've plans, stay tuned. Ben. Ellen, thank you very much. And that's all from the BBC News One. So it's uh, goodbye from me. And on BBC One, We'll join the BBC's news teams where you are. Have a very good afternoon.